along with me. I'll let, give you a moment to find it. If you go to Genesis and take a right. So Psalm 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Amen. Nearly every Sunday we have a, a song by the choir or we have a video uh, which opens up our service and serves which, what we call a, a call to worship. The idea is that that song or that video would set our minds to thinking about why we have gathered here and, and what it is that we want to happen. We've come to worship God. First and foremost, that is what this time between 10.30 and noon on Sunday morning is all about. But many people have some confused ideas about what worship is. We think that the different things that we do in the context of a worship service is what constitutes worship. We had prayer and testimony, and so we think that we've worshiped. But prayer is not worship. Testimony is not worship. We listen to a pastor preach a sermon and we say that we worshiped, but the exposition of scriptures is not worship. Listening to a sermon is not worship. Now hopefully, all of these different things that we do in the midst of a worship service can work to produce true worship in us. But those things themselves are not worship. Worship is simply the expression of your heart and soul to God of adoration and gratitude. Not just for what he's done for you, but just for what and who he is. The word worship comes from an old English word and literally means worth-ship. When we worship, we are proclaiming the worth of God. You're stating what God is worth to you by you worshiping him. And by not worshiping him, you would be stating that he's not worth much to you. And I'm not just talking about those who don't come to church, but those who come to church but who just sit in the pews and observe the order of service, but who do nothing actually that resembles worship. Jesus said in John 4 that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But right before that, in verse 23, he says, these are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Jesus came to make it possible for us to sing with the choir in heaven. Holy is the Lord. Our Lord Almighty reigns. Jesus came so that we can have access to that throne of God and so that we can truly worship him. Yes, he also calls us to follow him and, and to serve him and to obey him. But the call of God from the foundation of the earth is for him to be worshipped. And if we would spend more time just in simple, pure worship of God, we would have a whole lot less questions that we often try to ask. We would have a lot fewer problems and misunderstandings as a church. We've had a lot better ideas of what our purpose is as the family of God. It's not that our sole purpose is to worship, but it is a big part of, of what it is. Hopefully, you know our purpose statement as a church. If you don't, you need to learn it, because that's a, we've been pumping this into uh, each other from the time when we stated it. It says to bear fruit for the kingdom of God, and each of those letters of the word fruit stand for something. And the first is, the letter F is about worship, freely worshiping him in spirit and truth. But there's others too. There's R-U-I-T. Say it with me if you know it. R is about ministry, reaching out to meet the specific needs of others. Uh, U is about the fellowship that we share, which is part of our purpose, unifying the body of Christ in love and friendship. I is about our task of evangelism as a church, which is inviting our neighborhood to share our Christian experience. And the T is about another important purpose that we have as a church, that of discipleship, which is teaching believers to grow and to serve. And so our purpose is not just to worship, but worship is simply what God's people do. It is the natural response of being set apart to serve the Lord. Psalm 33 is a call to worship. I'm sure you know that the word psalms mean songs. You know, the, the psalms are a compilation of songs, kind of like our hymn book. 
Actually, it's more like our chorus book that we use on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Uh, the Psalms were used in the assemblies of Old Testament worship, and they were compiled by King David, and most of them were written by David, but some were not. Some were written by other people, and some of them we don't even know who wrote. There are a few with no author named. These are sometimes called the orphan psalms. Psalms 33 is one of those. But David considered it important enough to include it in his chorus book, the book of Psalms, which we then view as the inspired word of God Almighty. Well, the reason it's important is because it calls our attention to the necessity of worshiping God. True worship, worship that comes from the heart, that, that's of the spirit, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, has nothing to do with the order of service in a church bulletin, but it is that personal connection between you and the Lord God. Have you come to worship and to praise the Lord this morning? Well, if you have, then it doesn't really matter if you like everything that's in the order of worship of the church service. It doesn't matter whether or not you like me or my sermons or my suit or the color of the carpet or whatever. It doesn't matter if you like the hymns or the praise songs that have been chosen. But you have come to concentrate on the Lord and to praise Him and to worship Him. That's all that really matters. Praise is something that is hard for some people to do. Some people find it the hardest thing to, to pay somebody else a compliment. Maybe they don't want the person to get a big head, or maybe they don't want to be an insincere flatterer. But mostly, it's hard because by praising someone else, that means that someone else is recognized for their abilities that you might not have, or, or perhaps someone else is getting credit for something that you can do just as well. But basically, if we fail to compliment someone else, it's because of our own pride. Well, some people have a hard time praising God, too. They're just kind of uncomfortable with the whole idea. I've heard all sorts of excuses. Well, it's just not dignified, or it's just not my personality, and so on. But I want you to think for a moment about how arrogant and how prideful it is to refuse to praise the Lord. We are commanded to do so here in Psalm 33, and if for no other reason than that, we should be singing our lungs out for the Lord. But if you have to force yourself to do that, maybe it's time for an attitude adjustment. It's time for something to change. Right away in verse 1 of Psalm 33, it says, It's fitting for the upright to praise Him. So when you come to church, come to worship. Come if for no other reason just to praise the Lord. The chief form in which worship has taken place over the centuries has been music, either vocal or instrumental. Now, by no means is that the only way, but it is certainly has become the major universal way to worship. You go anywhere in the world where there are believers and they're going to sing to the Lord. And I don't want to put down any of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, but one thing I've never understood is how a group of Christians feel that it can be wrong to have musical instruments as a part of worship. I really just don't get that. Songs accompanied by instruments have been the biblical pattern of worship for millenniums. As verse 2 says, Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-string lyre. Now, music is the perfect way to worship the Lord because it expresses the sincerity of the heart in, in a way that nothing else really can. And it's not just because of the pretty sound of the music, because sometimes it's really not all that pretty. <laughs> but it's ra rather the way that it's done. Verse 3 says, Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Now, for those of us who love music, then worship is made easy. But even if you don't love music, there are other ways to worship through the music. Read the words as they're being sung, if you don't like to sing them. Or say them, or shout them, or just go ahead and sing off-key. It's all right. But just let it come from your heart. Don't just sit there or stand there until that part of the service is over. We are here to praise the Lord. If you do have skills, then use them. And how thankful I am for our skilled musicians and the help that they give us in leading our worship. As I've said, the psalms are songs. They are the, the lyrics to actual songs. Now, we don't know what the melodies were, but each one of the, those psalms had a, me a melody, much like our chorus book. They were constructed to be sung with, with stanzas and refrains and choruses. And experts say that this particular song, Psalm 33, consisted of the first three verses and the last three being a refrain or a chorus. The middle 16 verses then were two stanzas of eight verses each. 
And it is thought that in Old Testament worship, the choir master would begin by singing the first three verses, and then the choir would sing the stanzas, and then the congregation would respond by singing the last three verses. And I'm going to talk more about the response of the congregation in a minute. But first, let's look at the body of this psalm, the content of what it is that we are to worship God for. What about him should we be worshiping? Now, there is no book in the world that could contain all there is to praise the Lord about. But these verses do give us a broad synopsis of what God is about and what he has done that is worthy of our worship. So what is his worth-ship? The first stanza of this psalm, which would be verses 4 through 11, combines the characteristics of the Lord's sovereignty and his creativity, closing with verse 11, which says, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. So God is creator of all things, and he is in control of all things. These two ideas are linked together by the use of the expression, the word of the Lord. We find that in verses 4 and 6. Verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. And verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. The word of the Lord, that which he has said, is inseparable from the work of the Lord, that which he has done. In other words, what God says, he does. He created the universe. How did he do that? Remember Genesis? By speaking. By his word. He revealed himself to us through the scriptures. His word, and through his word, we come to understand both his sovereignty and his creativity. And it's no coincidence that Jesus Christ is called the word, because Jesus embodies both the creative and the sovereign power of God Almighty. And so we worship God, and we worship his son Jesus, for he is sovereign, and he is creator. The second stanza, which would be what Kelsey read for us in verses 12 through 19, indicates another aspect of his worthiness the worship of God. More reasons are given why we should worship him. Well, this stanza combines the characteristics of the Lord's justice and his deliverance. Now, on the surface, those two things might seem to be contradictory. You know, how can God be both our judge and our savior? But he is, and that's why we should worship and praise him, because he who alone is able to judge and to discern our sin and to righteously punish it chooses to save us from that punishment if we just let him. We can't save ourselves, but we can choose to be saved by him. As verse 16 says, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain for deliverance, despite all its great strength. It cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Again, these two concepts are revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The justice of God was completely manifested as Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sin. God is judge of all, and he fulfilled the requirements of a faithful, righteous judge by punishing sin to its fullest degree. But because of Jesus, we also see that he is deliverer. Jesus took our punishment, and those who believe that those who have received that gift, those who fear the Lord enough to worship him, those whose faith is in his unfailing love and not their own goodness, they are given the gift of eternal life. And all that's left for us to do then is just to worship him. Well, what happens when we truly worship God? What is the result of that? Well, three times in verses 18 through 22, we see the word hope. Hope is the result of worship. I mentioned that this last section was believed to be the congregational response to the, this worship song. But if you have come today and you have worshiped God from your heart, I can guarantee you that you can walk out of those doors today with a renewed sense of hope. That's what worship does. If you came today looking maybe for something that you could get out of the service or something that would meet your needs, maybe that happened. Maybe you got something. Maybe your needs were met. I hope so, but, but maybe they weren't. But if you came to worship God, then you got something. I know that. You've got hope in the Lord. We see what hope is as it is defined for us here in verses 20 through 22 in its purest sense. First of all, 
Hope develops patience. Verse, first part of verse 20 says, We wait in hope for the Lord. Now, it's easier to wait for something when you know what's coming. Now, most of the time that we get impatient is because we have developed an uncertainty about what we were waiting for is ever going to happen. But hope in the Lord develops patience. We can learn to wait if our hope was in the Lord. Secondly, hope breeds confidence. Second part of verse 20 says, He is our help and our shield. If you have worshipped God, and have received his hope, then you can go home today with your head up and your spirits high, no matter what may be happening in your life, because you can have that confidence that God is our sovereign creator, and he is our righteous judge, and he is our merciful savior. He is your hope and your shield. Thirdly, hope yields joy. Verse 21 says, the first part, in him our hearts rejoice. When you truly worship, the only possible result is joy. Now, things may not be going very good for you right now. You may not feel like putting on a big phony smile on your face. Well, you don't have to. But the hope of the Lord, which you receive when you worship Him, means that you can still have joy in your heart. Joy that, we're told in scriptures, heals the brokenhearted. Joy which Nehemiah tells us is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And lastly, hope depends on knowledge. Verse 21b says, For we trust in His holy name. Trusting in His holy name means believing in what God has told us about Himself. He has revealed Himself to us in the many different names that the Bible uses to identify God. What a great study that is, just to look at the, the different names of God. And each of those names tells us something different that we can know about God. And so trusting in his name means knowing who he is. The more you know about him, the more completely you can worship him, and the more complete your hope is. And the more your prayer becomes verse 22, which says, May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, as we put our hope in you. This is our call to worship. It is vital to your spiritual life and vitality. Maybe you didn't come to church today prepared to worship. But every Sunday morning and evening and Wednesday night, you have the opportunity to prepare yourself for true worship. And I urge you to do that so that the hope and the joy and the strength of the Lord may be yours. And if you're here today and you don't have any of those things, the only way to get them is by placing your faith in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf and to become a Christian. So as we close our service, we'd like to extend to you an invitation to do just that. We're going to sing about our, our, our faith in God's Word and our faith in who He is, who reigns above. He's sovereign, He's creator, He's merciful, and He's our judge. And as we sing, if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior, would you just please just step out of your pew and come up to the front and 